Hello everybody and welcome to this month's practice group for specifiers. Uh, with that, I do want to hand it over to David and Lewis, our co-chairs, uh, to get started with today's session. Dave and Lewis, over to you. Thank you, Matt. This is Dave coming to you from frigid New Jersey. And if any of you are on the West Coast, please do send us a little bit of your warmer temperature. It's cold here in Nashville, too. It's uh, sunny, but this morning it was about 5 degrees when I left for work, which is very unusual for, for Nashville. And I understand from Mark Kalin that Boston saw its coldest day ever um, last night, and he's praying that whomever is working on their heating system in their building is actually going to be turned into a saint and get it to work. So. Uh, today, uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion of late, and our CSI technical committee is actually working on a paper uh, with the same title as a program today. So I, I chose this only because Lewis had no say. He was on vacation, and I had to come up with the title so Matt could uh, announce the program to everybody. So this is it, the future of specifications. So what we're hoping to do is be able to open the discussion with our group today to get collect your opinions as well as the points that Lewis and I will go over as part of the presentation because I think that when it comes to future specifications, really everybody's opinion is valid because we're all coming at this from a different point of view, different experience, different exposure, different projects. And there is no one future, because everybody will perceive the future differently anyhow. Um, and one of the things we're going to be, the, a kind of a basic underlying concept of this presentation that Dave and I have you know, thought about, <coughs> is we're not going to necessarily talk about ways, quickie ways to improve you know the the process at present. What we're looking for is actually we have a suspicion that ten years from now, or when, or sometime in the not distant future, that specifications are not going to be the traditional three-part sections that are five, six, seven pages long and uh, collected into a, a project manual, and whether that manual is actually printed or distributed electronically really doesn't make any difference. We suspect that there are going to be some reasons why not only is the production of specifications going to be different, but the actual end result is going to be quite different from what we're familiar with. And then, so those are some ideas that we want to explore today. And hopefully you enjoy some of the uh, magazine covers that Lewis was able to come up with. The first one, though, I think saw a little Photoshop. Uh, yes, it's uh, my two-year-old granddaughter, Gwyneth, and I, I managed to sneak her on to an amazing story. So, so there. Okay. So with, with any look to the future, I think part of it needs to be looking maybe slightly backward and at our current situation. So we started out looking at some of the challenges that we see in the industry today. And these are uh, perceptions that Lewis and I have. And I think that it's really about, you know, there, the technology is advancing faster than any of the industry changing uh, is happening that the specifications are really lagging behind uh, with the advances in technology that have been happening over the past 10 to 20 years. Uh, you're uh, getting slightly ahead of us there, David. But uh, yeah, th we want to start with the challenges because whatever specifications are going to become and uh, many of our listeners today are going to be the people who are going to drive those changes. We've got some creative people and uh, responsible people who are going to look for new solutions and to do that we need to state what the problem is. 
So that's why we're going to start with some of the, the challenges. So one of the things that I see daily is that virtually every project that we deal with, every project team, has their own set of processes. There are no, there's really no standardization uh, between, there's certainly little standardization and virtually none between offices and sometimes even within the same office. Uh, everybody is approaching these projects differently and that's creating a, a complexity uh, that's really unmanageable at the moment. The individual projects are becoming more and more complex. I mean, we're seeing some with with what we're trying to do for energy savings, with what we're trying to do with building systems, each one of these things is adding a level of complexity that's making it more and more difficult to manage and more and more difficult to specify. Uh, David, David, you want to go to the next slide? We're, we're seeing that we talked about the first couple of points. We're looking at uh, faster and faster completion, and I know everybody is facing this, not only just the design team, but also the construction team. Uh, we're looking at fast track projects, we're looking at how can we get through the process as quickly as possible because it all comes down to the dollar and getting that front door of the building open. And one of the reactions to those pressures is that people, at least from my limited perspective, uh, I see project teams, not only in my office, but other offices, starting to kind of maybe get a little informal, shall we say, about issuing documents and, and tracking documents and, and doing some of the things that were carefully worked out over the last hundred years to keep us out of trouble. Uh, people are starting to, uh, to give way to time pressures and kind of cut corners a little bit. Keep going, Lars. <laughs> and then, we're, of course, we have. Uh, but then, the, the challenge is the conflicting attitudes. Is that that on the one hand, uh, people want stuff right away, but uh, if we ever get into any kind of a hiccup, then those attitudes uh, quickly disappear, and it's all a matter of, well, why didn't you do it exactly the way it's been done for the last hundred years? Uh, the demographics is an, an issue that uh, is probably most of you know the United States is not replacing itself in terms of its population. Uh, our birth rate is, is well below replacement levels. And in particular, as you go up the, uh, the socioeconomic levels in the professions, uh, that's even more true than at other levels or other parts of the of our society. And at the same time, uh, I was born the first year of the baby boom, 1946, and a lot of guys my age and even younger are already starting to retiring. And we're a big, big bump in the population of AE firms. And so uh, though we're starting to exit. I still need to pay off my house, so I'm going to hang around for a while. But at the same time, the number of people who are actually going into the business at the, uh, at the entry level that are coming out of college and going into architecture is decreasing, uh, partly because there are two other industries that are competing for architectural graduates, namely uh, Hollywood in terms of CG and uh, also the uh, the gaming industry, which sounds silly, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And who do you think designs all the, the dungeons for uh, all those one first party uh, player game systems? And, and one of the most recent things that's happened too with the economy tanking earlier this century, uh, we've lost a good number of those middle staff Yes, and probably will never come back to the industry. Right, they got their fingers burned and either they're, uh, they may be st kind of be in the industry in the sense of, I know a number of people who have gone to work for developers or large institutions as project managers or whatever, but they're not actually producing uh, drawings and specs for new projects. Right. 
So we're also looking at uh, folks that can use or use their own professional judgment to verify machine decisions. And this, this is becoming more and more a problem because we're relying on machines to do more and more for us. Uh, I had an own, my own personal uh, aha moment, I guess, with that is when I was relying on a code checking program uh, or code review program where I was actually designing a an H1 hazardous use building and H1 under the code is only permitted to be single story. Well, because of the process that went on in the building, it had to be two stories. I went through and, and did the whole code review saying that the building was two stories and the program never never even responded that that was not permitted. And so uh, <laughs> without without the knowledge, without that professional judgment, you would never somebody may never have caught that. And uh, I was shared with uh, David the other night when we were discussing this presentation uh, a case where uh, a structural engineer I know was uh, using a uh, program for calculating uh, concrete beams and columns and floors and the software did not have the state that he was working in had some special requirements for the connection between the column and the floor slabs and this program did not have that in there he didn't check it carefully himself to to see that it was missing that code requirement. It's not a, a requirement, the building is not in danger of falling down or anything. It's it's merely a matter of it did not meet this specific code requirement. And so it's going to cost a lot of money to go back and retrofit uh, some of this uh, additional reinforcing uh, that the machine didn't miss. So, Whenever we start to rely on machines, we need to make sure that somebody who has the professional judgment and expertise can take a look at it and make sure that it works. You know, the, uh, as uh, the old saying is, uh, real stupidity can always defeat artificial intelligence. I had not heard that. That's interesting. Uh, I'd like to just ask everybody that's with us today on the next bullet point, increasing demand to load BIM with project data. How many of you, if you would, just raise your hand as a way of taking a straw poll here. How many of you are actually seeing this phenomenon now? How many are being requested to uh, insert uh, actual project data into the uh, BIM model? rather than just building the visual aspect of a project. We have a couple, not very many. We have four that say that they're um, adding the data to the model. I was, I was expecting to see more. It's been uh, talked about recently, it's been in the magazines, it's been the promotion, it's been sort of the, the BIM will uh, save us all from ourselves perhaps, but it can only do that if it has the data to be able to manipulate, to be able to help with the project. So I'm, I'm a bit surprised that I'm not seeing more of a uh, reflection from our audience, but interesting. And I think the last one, uh, we're seeing more and more a requirement to that the specifications are increasing in volume. Be they're becoming much more detailed than they have been in the past, uh, getting down to some levels of detail that uh, otherwise have been unseen. I just had the opportunity to review an exterior uh, wall assembly specification that went well over a hundred pages for a single spec section, which was really about the curtain wall and glazing. Do we really need that kind of volume to be able to talk about an exterior wall? But I think that that's, as we get subject matter experts 
involved in a project, it's more and more likely that we're going to see that kind of volume. Well, we need to be on our guard against, in terms of, we want to make sure that our specifications are free from meaningless stuff, whatever that whatever the specifications eventually look like. And we need to be careful that they don't, don't grow uh, uncontrolled in such a way that, well, it's like a coral reef. You know, the individual coral animals are, are very tiny, but you get it grown big enough and it'll sink any ship in the world. OK, so now we've talked a bit about the challenges. I would open it up to you. Uh, in comments, what sorts of challenges are you seeing that you think are are going to drive the future of the specifications? And as you're as you're entering some of your thoughts, what we'll do is uh, start talking about what we see as the spec purposes. Uh, it's starting in the design phases. It's really about demonstrating compliance with the owner's project requirements. It's proving to the owner that what the design is going to produce is actually going to meet uh, the owner's expectations. And one of the things I like to say, too, it's about recording and communicating those design decisions so that there's a record, so that we know why we've made the decisions that we made. And um, this is necessary for coordination uh, because in the past, Many times the mechanical engineers, they did not, either did not trust the information that was coming from the architects or just didn't have it, and they would size their equipment on their assumptions of what the exterior walls and roof were going to be in terms of uh, insulative value and uh, solar uh, uh, insulation and so forth. So. We can't afford to do that anymore. We need to have a, a more rational approach to the design of, of systems that is based on real decisions and uh, real information. Well, that is what all this is about, isn't it? Making a decision <laughs> and then recording it. And communicating it among the team so that they're not oversizing their chillers and stuff. There's always hope. <laughs> okay, as we get into the CD phase, it's really specifications are about setting contract requirements so that we can monitor the fact that the construction is actually fulfilling um, the owner's project requirements. It's the only it's the only tool that we have on the qualitative side to know that the end result is actually meeting the owner's requirements and the constructed facility will uh, perform as intended. We get into CA phase and it's all about monitoring. It's about watching what the contractor is doing and using the specifications to ensure that the construction is proceeding according to the contract and that the owner gets what it is paying for. Right. As we get into operations phase, it's been suggested that specifications can actually perform a function during the operations phase that it will become valuable data for the owner. I don't know that I agree to that or agree with that position because I'm not sure that it's the specification per se as much as it is information about the installed products, about the operation and performance of the installed systems, which is not necessarily something that you would find in a specification, but might be coming out of the manufacturer's operation and maintenance um, data and if the design team would do it out of a facility operation and maintenance manual. Uh, David, before you go to the next slide, uh, this uh, cover that I selected is a, the illustration. I hope that everybody notices that in the lower right-hand corner, this wonderful spaceship that's 
probably intended to go between stars is uh, being built uh, with products that are being delivered by a steam locomotive. <laughs> and we, well, want, we want to be careful that we're not operating steam locomotive technology to write specs for an interstellar spaceship. And these covers were what, from the 1930s? Yeah, mid-1930s. Yes. <laughs> So we had a couple of comments here, Lewis. I just before oh, okay. we get too far along, this has to do with entering data into BIM, and and Eric uh, McNovis, pardon me, Eric, if I butchered your last name, uh, says entering spec data into BIM is still in this talk stage and not in the action stage, in my experience. And Chuck Coleman says our people routinely import actual product information into Revit drawings, but we aren't being asked to do that by clients or contractors. Now I might ask we might ask Chuck, are we actually importing information in terms of like written attributes or are we importing pre drawn elements? Yeah, objects. objects that the manufacturers may have provided. And uh, perhaps you would uh, respond to that. Okay, pre-drawn elements. One of the things, we do a lot of healthcare work and um, our practice technology guys who try to keep our Revit uh, running nice and clear get really upset with people who bring in like an examination table that has operating drawers in it where the drawer in the at the base of the table and the back lifts up and everything that's all beautifully drawn but boy it sure does eat up the memory well it's important to be able to show the different drawer positions in contract <laughs> documents isn't it tell us about limitations Okay, well, I'm going to put our group to work again. Okay. So I'm just going to ask again with raising the hands, how many of you are actually relying on manufacturer-provided BIM objects to help build your Revit models or whatever other BIM program you're using? And while we're getting a response, Donald Coppe states that for the state of Missouri, we were required to put product data sheets into tag info into the BIM families. Okay. We have very few takers on this again, Lewis. We have uh, three or four that are saying they're actually using manufacturers uh, BIM objects. Yeah. So again, not a, not a great... And Chuck follows up with a statement that for components but not for the entire model. Right. Well, okay. one of the limitations is that <clears throat> at present is that we're a little bit that for the first time uh, writing specs is significantly behind the technology of producing drawings and uh, if you'll hit the next slide David I think it takes us over to that comparison chart ah okay in the beginning I needed a new hut or I needed a new uh, shed for my animals I uh, waved my arms, I pasted out on the ground, and then I, if somebody was helping me build it, I told them exactly what I wanted. I told it verbally. And then we invented ink and something to write on. And, uh, and whether it was drawings or specifications, they were at the same level. And we then progressed to ink or pencil drawn on paper or mylar and we reproduce them with blueprints so now we can make multiple copies where before we had to if any copies would have to be made by hand and we've got typewriters that can cut stencils, stencils for mimeograph machines. I actually remember uh, running the mimeograph machines to, to produce specifications back in the in the 60s. Uh, the progress from that is we're still uh, drawing with ink or pencil, but we now invented blue line prints. And about the same time they brought in, the, while I was still in school, the magnetic card typewriter. 
that could cut stencils so that you could uh, correct errors much easier and uh, once uh, you could make changes. Uh, then we got into CAD drafting to produce blue line prints and we're, now we're in, analogous is word processing. Uh, when I got my first uh, word processing computer uh, at my uh, a couple of offices ago back in the 80s, uh, I actually had a bigger hard drive than the guy than the CAD guy. So I was in some ways more advanced than than they were. And then we've got into BIM, and we are starting to distribute drawings with elect. Uh, electronically, but now all of a sudden BIM is way ahead of us because it's a database that creates drawings, but we're still using word processing output for photocopying and PDF electronic distribution. And then, so uh, we've actually got behind. There are some programs, eSpecs and SpecLink and a couple of others that have some sort of linkage between uh, BIM and the specifications, but it's usually a one-way linkage, and it's not a, a full database concept in the sense that if I want to change, I can't, we can regard uniformat and master format as two structured queries for the construction data that's in a given project. And we can sort it for uniformat for one purpose, or we can sort it by master format for construction specifications and other purposes. But there, at the present, I don't know of any system that allows us to write these things in one format, press a button, and resort the information into the other format for other purposes. That's in the last step, isn't it? <laughs> really? Well, Vivian, right? well, We're Vivian going Bolts. to the uh, cloud virtual reality. Who needs BIM? And um, you know, just create it and stand in the middle of it and manipulate it as you need it. And when we need the spec, we'll rely on the matrix version. Just load the program. <laughs> Vivian Volt says, yep, one way from BIM to specs can happen, but we still get word process specs out of eSpecs exported to PDF. Okay. So as I say, in the first this is the first time in history that the drawings have that there's been a significant technological gap between producing contract drawings and producing contract specifications. Okay, so do we go back, Lewis? Yes. Let's talk about some of these other limitations. I think I think the database is a big limitation. I think there are some things on the horizon that could help to right. solve that, but it still is a limitation today. <coughs> We're stuck in a paper world, are we not? Uh, the, you have to ask the lawyers about that. Oh, uh, and I know what they're going to tell us. They're definitely in a paper world. Uh, or at least documents that appear to be paper or could be paper. Because at least that way they can share them through discovery and share them with the courts because uh, we need things that are readable uh, by the courts. We still are in a production method and it's mostly because of contractual requirements where we're, deliver, or we're delivering these discrete packages of information uh, based upon design phases. So at the end of SD you deliver one thing, at the end of DD you deliver something else, and at the end of CD you deliver the final construction specs. So it doesn't, it doesn't relate well to this flow, the continuous uh, flow of information that we have as we're developing a project. Cut to the diagram. <laughs> Back to the diagram? Back to the diagram. Oh. Do you have a direct link there? Yeah. Okay. I should just back out. Over here. This one. Yeah. There should have been a link. That should have been the next 
slide. But anyway, so what we're talking about is the traditional method was like beads on a string. And every time you started a new phase, you basically filed the old stuff because you couldn't reuse it. It wasn't truly re reusable. Uh, and and uh, even schematic design plans, because we colored in the walls uh, and colored them in solid, they, we couldn't reuse them for design development. We'd have to redraw the plan. But what we, the ideal situation is where we start with a little trickle up in northern uh, Minneapolis that becomes the, the conceptual phase that the owner realizes its needs and draws up a program. And then we have tributaries that uh, add additional information to that, that stream of data. So the schematic design adds stuff, and the design development builds on information that's already there. It, some of it may change. We're certainly going to add it. but. We're not starting over. We're, we've got a continuous flow until it uh, exits into the Gulf of Mexico as a mighty stream for facilities management. Lewis, is there some subconscious uh, sliding here of everything east of the Appalachians? <laughs> no, that's, this diagram is showing the watershed <laughs> of all the of all the areas that is drained through the, the Mississippi as it exits into the Gulf of Mexico. It is phenomenal. It's like almost 40% of the United States goes, goes uh, right by um, New, New Orleans. Okay, we had a comment from Mike McVitie. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mike. Uh, he's saying there is at least one firm in the Northwest that has experimented with, with placing PPD element information in a database, and he cites Speclink as the way to get that done. We had another comment from Wayne Yancey saying, even with BIM, the information flow still happens in continued design. <laughs> CD. The alternative definition of CD. Yeah. yeah, the alternative CD definition. And Vivian Voles uh, added that, yep, one way for BIM to specs can happen, but we still get word process specs out of eSpecs exported to PDF. So still going back to the paper delivery method. Longevity. Oh, that's one of yours. What the heck did you mean by that one? <laughs> what did I mean? I have architects that are telling me virtually daily when I talk to them about BIM, I want everything to remain generic in the model as long oh, as I possible. Oh, I see. Yes. Right. Right? But some elements can remain generic much longer than others. Gosh, I would sure hope that they decide on the exterior wall earlier than they do on that final. Um, grab bar in the uh, toilet stall. Right, so, or, or even uh, if, as long as you've decided on a single ply roofing, uh, which one, which type could be decided a couple of days before the uh, project goes out the door. Whether not if you want that spec coordinated. <laughs> What's the difference? Lewis, now look, you're, <laughs> I've got to have a chat with you. All right, let's go to the next one. <laughs> Good idea. Before we fight over this one, okay, I, I see what you did, and I didn't realize you had us going every which way, and I didn't follow the path. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Okay. But um, BIM objects, we we'll go back one. Hmm? Back one. We haven't finished back that one. one. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. BIM objects. Unfor right at present are not necessarily created by the technical decision maker. And, and that's a limitation. I just recently, uh, it's been a while since I looked at eSpecs and I watched their little presentation on the, on the web. And one of the things that struck me about it is that whoever was doing it in terms of the linkages with 
Revit that this is a senior person who is making the decisions of what products are going into the specifications, who is also drawing them, or not drawing them, but entering them into the database. But that's really not the case in most. Well, and I think that plays into why the architects are asking for things to remain generic. Yes. So, in the next one, no one commented on this. Uh, I missed it. I missed. I caught Carware. Your misspellings. Yes. yes. <laughs> that was me. I transcribed it. Uh, but the well, problem anyhow. with that is again. There at present, there are simply some limitations, not so much on the uh, storage, but of information, and of the size of files, but being able to manipulate files. There are lim practical limitations to just how much information you can stuff into BIM and still have it uh, work uh, in a practical method. Yeah, but the 256-bit processor is going to solve all that for us. <laughs> We're going to skip right over the 128. <laughs> okay. Okay. The and the last the last thing that we're going to say is a is a limitation currently is just being able to get the data out of BIM and have it uh, usable as a contract document uh, with all the I'll call it the collateral qualitative data. Think about the, the specifications we're producing today. The, the data seems to be centered that you would be able to put into BIM seems to be centered around products. It doesn't necessarily include things that we would typically find in part one or in part three, uh, but add to that qualitative information that we need to be able to form a valid construction contract. So until we find a way to deal with that, I think it still will become, at least in part, some limitation. So where do we think this is going, Lois? Well, you made that wonderful presentation at the uh, convention, which we reprised in this group, uh, what was it, last month or the month before, about using Uniformat to into the CD phase to organize the construction documents and perhaps combined with uh, standardized mini spec sections for the constituent element um, components of the various elements. Yeah, I and I've been a proponent for a while. I, I love Uniformat. I think that it works well, especially with BIM because it can link one to one. Uh, they're both organized as elements, uh, so it makes that linking fairly easy. And it also allows you to identify individual products or components of assemblies, which could get you down to a master format uh, specification type level and could be able to link from Uniformat then out to master format. And perhaps link to more standardized uh, kinds of specifications, not unlike the uh, Master Paint Institute method of uh, specifying uh, different paint systems. Uh, Vivian Volz uh, comments, I think we'd need smaller chunks of data encapsulating parts one, two, and three info in order to assign effective specs to models. And, and that's that's the whole issue is how much at the same time that uh, our specification sections are getting longer and longer how can we pair them back in such a way that that they could be uh, linked and not bring the uh, machine that's uh, processing the BIM to a crashing halt. Well I think some of that was actually started I know Mark Kalin worked on this and that's the uh, SPY um, program, the Specifier Property Set, uh, Property Information Exchange. And Mark spent a lot of time going through the uh, United Facilities um, guide specs and actually created a list of, um, call it attributes, uh, for each of the spec sections in the guide spec. And it was really about 
identifying those kinds of attributes of products that would actually be specified. And that, I think, could be a very handy list in trying to identify uh, what it is that we need to be concerned about in being able to fill in some of that data, even standardizing some of that data that we could use as a linked reference. So I don't know if it, that um, whole SPY program is still available, I believe, on the um, whole building design guide if anybody is interested in checking it out. It's got, it's got a lot of good information. It's got a great start to where I think we may need to be. And I think Mark is still looking for uh, volunteers to help with that uh, project. Right. And that actually plays into some of the things that are also out there. And Kobe is another one that's for the um, building operations information exchange. Uh, so and one of the the concepts here would be that uh, these would be very short, very abbreviated uh, things because they would be focused in on a much smaller amount of stuff. They'd be very narrow. Uh, so, if, for example, you you might have a separate uh, spec for uh, ordinary gypsum board as opposed to abuse resistive gypsum board. So you, we would pair everything down to two or th uh, a single paragraph maybe with two or three sub-paragraphs and then perhaps one paragraph talking about uh, installation requirements. And many of the part one subjects would be covered in perhaps a more detailed version of division one. Okay. I'd like to ask another straw poll here for our group. Uh, one of the formats that we haven't mentioned that CSI has been involved in is OmniClass. And I'd like to know how many of you at least know what OmniClass is, recognize the name. Just raise your hand. Yes, we're not asking how many understand it and have all of those uh, uh, multi-digit <laughs> numbers uh, starting to memorize them. Oh, well, good. Wow. That's, that's uh, probably a majority of you. So yeah. that, that's a good sign. Now, um, what has been proposed in what is beginning to show up in Revit is the use of OmniClass along with the use of Uniformat. Uniformat is established in Revit as the assembly code, but they've also included a place now to include OmniClass um, numbering schemes for the different objects. How many of are actually using the Uniformat or assembly codes in, in Revit, if you're using Revit, or, and how many have experimented with OmniClasses? You can answer yes to either part of that. Okay, it's uh, maybe about 20% of the folks attending today are using or at least experimenting with some of those classification systems. I, I will tell you that when I first started having clients actually furnish uh, models, their, their BIM files, one of the first things I did is I opened it up and just tried to schedule information out of the model relying on the assembly code or the uniformat number. And what I was su surprised to find was that the project happened to be a central utility plant and the exterior wall uh, in the construction documents was all insulated metal wall panel. When I queried the model, the only exterior wall panel um, was showing up as brick and block masonry veneer cavity wall, which really surprised me because somehow or other in, in this whole process they took a brick and block uh, object and turned it into an insulated metal wall panel or simply labeled the insulated metal <laughs> wall panel incorrectly. I have no idea. <laughs> 
but the, the data that was buried in the model just by doing a simple schedule was not at all what was represented in the, in the drawings that they were producing from the model. So even if we're trying to use the, the linking and the information going to uniform at or omni class, we need to make sure that that linking remains accurate. So we had a couple more comments here. Yeah, Vivian says we encourage architects to use generic assemblies, not guesses at the initial design phase. Marshmallow is what one of my BM, uh, BIM guru friends calls it. <laughs> I hadn't I heard like that, that term applied to it. <laughs> well, what, you know, what we'd like to see is um, a true database producing specifications with a true database that's linked to BIM and to the COBE information and, and all kinds of things that it starts out maybe even in the owner's office uh, before they even hire an architect. They could go through and say, well, start, because Uniformat is an analytical classification system, which is different from master format that's a merely a documentary classification system, uh, they can start to say, well, what do I want in terms of exterior walls? To, you know, what do I want in terms of uh, energy uh, conservation? Uh, do I even care? In some cases, if you're a factory owner, you may not care what the exterior walls are made out of. All you want is for them to keep the wind and the rain out and to have maybe a certain level of uh, insulative value. And then that information, then that uh, could be passed on to the architect who starts fleshing it out and says, oh, well, uh, maybe we'll try tilt up walls or maybe we'll do this other thing for to start describing the exterior walls. Uh, eventually, uh, we get to the CD phase where we need construction specifications that are organized by master format and so that this, this true database, uh, we institute a different structured query and it resorts the information into uh, master format organization so that it can actually be constructed. And during the construction, the um, contractor inputs into this database that of the three brands of sealant that we listed or the five brands of paint, these are the brands that we actually used. So that information is there. The other, inf and perhaps the other manufacturers even disappear. Uh, and then at the uh, completion of the construction, uh, we again do a different report with the, the uniformat as the structured query. It resorts all that information. So for facilities management, it's a lot friendlier for the building engineer, building uh, staff to say, well, say, oh, I'm missing some sealant was damaged. What, where do I need to look for the sealant? Oh, I go to exterior walls. I drill, drill down to the, uh, the masonry walls. I drill in and, oh, yeah, there it is. It's a medium modulus silicone sealant. And here's the brand that we used and the color information. And I just go out and buy another tube. Yeah, so yes, that still relies on the data being entered into BIM. Or a being database that, from BIM. A database that's accessible yeah, too. Now, I see it as probably a separate database that's somehow linked and they can talk to one another, but it needs to be able to talk both ways. Right yeah. now it's only a one way discussion and it may be the case where I can enter specification information that would actually change the BIM model object. We're going to let Google solve all this, aren't we? <laughs> That's right. I mean, they're taking over the technology world, so they might as well jump into this uh, foray. Um, really, I, I put this last one in here only to be maybe a little bit absurd, uh, at least by today's thinking, but who knows? I mean, it could be virtual uh, reality goggles that are displaying all of the BIM data and really it's 
um, manipulation by the individual. I mean, we see this now in even in the uh, military where uh, the jet fighter uh, pilots uh, have the equivalent of what is Google Glass except that they're getting displayed all the telemetry data from the uh, fighter so that they have better control and so that they can monitor where they are and what they're doing and right. complete their mission successfully. And, it, and instead of, uh, of a uh, monitor in front of us that's limited in size and looks like a porthole looking into the drawings, we have a some sort of holographic projection and I just wave my arms around and wave my fingers around and, and uh, move stuff around and make choices and decisions. So we're not going to solve everything today, but if anybody has some parting thoughts about what it is um, that you believe are the real possibilities, we'd like to hear them. Because I think when we look at it, this is very likely an improbability. Is it's not as simple as it might sound. Vivian, what did you see at Construct? You said not absurd. We saw such things at Construct. I must have missed that one. Sheldon Wolf says, Google will develop an app that extracts whatever you want from the model and present it in the way you want to see it. <laughs> I, you may very well be right, Sheldon. Somebody probably will. And Mike McVitie says, the future is specifications modeling in a database separate and linked or integrated in Dave's 256-bit world. Oh, yes, Vivian responded to your question about what you saw, and she said that there were VR virtual reality visors for BIM and documents. That they, uh, I, don't, I missed that one, too. But... We certainly know about those, and you know the people are using yeah. them for gaming and uh, for controlling uh, jet aircraft and things like that. So, how long? Yeah. There are two I mean, more comments here. I think that um, we need. To I, share. I do all my phone calls with a, a headset and a, a and a microphone anymore. I don't have a, a handset as such. Uh, Mike McVitie commented a little bit back. It says, scrupulously classified models are less than rare. We are not paid to create them. One of the problems with BIM is having to have a stringent and rigorous program of controlling how much information goes into it to make sure that it's good information and it's meaningful information. There's no point in putting meaningless stuff into a model in any more than there are uh, some of the meaningless paragraphs that you find in specifications. We need to avoid that. Right. And let's finish with Taylor Coley says, as a manufacturer, we like it when spec writers, architects, and architects request our specifications and drawings on each project. And I think this is probably going to using the manufacturer's information as part of the um, what gets inserted into the model. And uh, Donald Copy points out that we don't currently model sealants, or when we do, and when we do, will we uh, model the primer for the joint? Uh, specs will be specs, drawings parenthesis models will be drawings, models, and never will they be combined. And what about parts one and three? Well, and of course, we've, we've been talking about that. Yes, there are certain types of information that basically are not appropriate for drawings and always have been for the last few hundred years and I think will continue to be, be so. And so there might be linkages between those information, but uh, I suspect that there will always be separate written documents. But what they look like, I think, is going to be quite a bit different from what we've seen for the last several decades. And Wayne Yancey, I think we'll finish with you, Wayne. As a specifier, I have no influence on the information <laughs> put in the model. Especially if you're an outside consultant like David. And Wayne, maybe that's the part that really needs to change. 
<laughs> and Sheldon finishes up here, says, Sheldon Wolf, look up M6 VEO, accesses and changes models from a tablet. Okay, so anyone that wants to explore, there you go. Sheldon, thank you for the tip. Thanks very much. So we're here at the end of the hour, and we have our next meeting, which will be February 12th. Uh, no, I'm sorry, February 5th. I'm pushing us out a week. February 5th, the first Thursday, uh, back here at the same time. And this time, perhaps, I'll get Lewis to make up the uh, program without my help. <laughs> so thank you all for joining. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day and for contributing to the discussion.